What's up, everybody? I'm Katie. And I'm Morgan. And this is For Your Misinformation. We are two Midwestern feminists here to break down the political news that you need to know without the misinformation that you don't. Let us break down the problem and tell you what we're doing and what you can do to help solve it. Hi, everyone. You know that I love to give context and explain how social norms and the legislation and policies that are passed by the people we elect impact us and our communities. So uh, this is a really fun episode, really interesting episode, uh, but we recorded it before the shooting in Atlanta. Um, so it's even more like depressingly relevant. Uh, so we don't mention it in the episode, but I do want to address it and just like point out that, um, you know, racism, misogyny, and anti-sex work stigma all intersect. And that's why eight people, including six women of Asian descent are now dead. Um, it's coming out now that the shooter had ties to the evangelical church. Shocking, not shocking. Um, but there's a long history of discrimination against Asians in America beyond just the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I think it gets erased by people who aren't Asian American or Pacific Islander. Um, uh, I, another thing that I, um, I, we'll talk about this later, but when uh, Japanese Americans were kept in internment camps, they were given reparations afterwards. So just interesting, interesting to keep up there, it, or sorry, interesting to keep in mind because, uh, you know, there's a reason, there's a, there's a precedent for reparations in our country. We haven't talked about them much yet, but we should. Um, so we choose to marginalize sex workers with our shitty policies like SESTA-FOSTA, which Irene and I get into later, but we could just stop doing that at any point. It would just take electing people who support full decriminalization of consensual adult sex work. Um, you know, sex workers deserve the right to go to work and not be put in danger as much as anybody else. And when you criminalize sex work, it creates situations where sex workers can be exploited uh, by lots of different people, but by police officers in particular, there's a pretty uh, adversarial relationship there. Um, I don't know how many people know about this already, but in 2015 in Minneapolis, police officers were trying to do a massage parlor sting, but they had to stop because they kept sexually assaulting the people that they were supposed to be um, protecting, I guess, I don't know. So yeah, they're the people who we're told keep us safe. Um, and I don't know where they're supposed to go, to the other police, to HR, you know, there are no good options for them. So if we decriminalize sex work, they would have protections. And if they unionized, they'd have even more protections. Imagine that. So I, I invited Irene on the show because I love the newsletter that she writes for the Oldest Profession podcast. She is super smart and she's also a hilarious stand-up comedian. I want to play a clip for you guys real quick. They've legalized sex work. Are you guys friends of sex work? Woo! Oh, thank God. My, who isn't? I mean, I guess like cops aren't. Um, I love sex work. I think it's very stupid when people talk down on sex work and try to like say like they're better than sex workers. I think that doesn't make any sense. Like when people are like, oh, like you look like a whore. It's like, I look like someone who would literally pay to fuck me. <laughs> Misha comp, bitch. <laughs> Irene had a birthday between, actually both of us did. Today's my birthday. If I sound wiser, um, it's because I turned 30 today. Also, I had my second Moderna shot yesterday and I feel like garbage. I have a headache. I had chills. I am like achy everywhere. I mean, I'm not complaining. I just want, I don't know, be prepared that you might be very, very sore and miserable after your second COVID shot, potentially, you know, just anecdotally, but I feel like garbage and I really wish I'd recorded this last night, but it's fine. Um, so happy birthday to Irene. <laughs> um, 
I I gotta be honest. I say Misha Comp bitch in my head at least like twice a week now. Um, but it was great to talk to her. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Irene Fagan Miro. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We are going to be talking about how sex work is work and how sex workers are workers. And we have a very exciting guest, uh, one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram. Her name is Irene Fagan Marrow. She is a comedian and a sex worker, and she writes one of my favorite newsletters. Um, it's called The Oldest Profession. Um, hi, Irene. Thanks for being here today. Oh my God, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yay, I'm so glad. I- Okay, so uh, your podcast, The Oldest Pro- Well, sorry, you write the newsletter for the podcast, The Oldest Profession. It's a really, really good podcast that I also recommend. <laughs> and you guys just started doing uh, a series on the victims of Jack the Ripper, right? That's for this month? Yeah, exactly. So um, Caitlin Bailey is the, the podcast um, host of the, the Oldest Profession podcast. So I do like social media. I'm like the social media whore, I like to say. I do all the social for them and and write the newsletter that I'm so glad you like. Uh, That makes me so happy to hear. Oh, good. Right. I learned so much every time. Yeah. We had a meeting this morning and I was like, you know, I try my best to stay up to date with everything happening in sex work news. Mm -hmm. Um, But this really keeps me on top of it because I have to write it every week. So I'm like, what is happening? (laughs) Right. Um, But yeah, so every month, pretty much the Oldest Profession podcast centers, um, does a series on a certain old pro or sex worker from the past and present. And this month is Jack the Ripper's victims. So focusing on the woman he murdered and not the murderer himself. (laughs) Right. Because they were people too. Yeah. Can you believe? Turns out. Who knew? (laughs) Um, And actually, don't you sometimes write the newsletter for Betches Sup? Is that right? Yeah, I do. Um, Cool. My dear friend, Elise Morales, usually writes it. She's so funny. Everyone should follow her. But sometimes she's busy. So when she is, she texts me and she's like, can you write it? And it's always a lot of fun. That's cool. I've I've messaged her before and just been like, I don't understand how you do what you do. And she was very nice about it. But it's like, how do you do, – she puts out like that newsletter daily, right? Yeah. It's, I don't – I don't know. I don't have like a tenth of that productivity, but – yeah, I agree. Cool. She's also great on Instagram. One time, one time she was uh, like on vacation or something. So um, I had to do it for a week. And even just after a week, because it was also, you know, during the whole Trump administration, I was like, damn, I just, if, even having to do that first thing when I woke up every morning, I was like, oh, that was a lot of like digesting horrible news every day. So yes. yeah, the rock star. And so you're very good also at like breaking stuff down in like a simple, smart way that like ties it into other issues that makes it relevant. But you're also funny while you do that, which I feel like I'm, that's the part that like I'm not great at. I'm always just like, man, everything sure is terrible, but I forget to infuse it with humor. So like, I think people think I'm a downer. Do you like, I, and I think it's because you're so good at pointing out how like how absurd so much of the bullshit that sex workers have to deal with is. Um, do you have any like tips? Like, wh- how do you do it? <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of just like I've I've always kind of been like that of you know using humor as a coping mechanism. Um, like in my in my bio on my old website, I always said that like my style of humor is like relishing in the absurdities that make me deeply upset. Like it's hard for me to be serious. Like like I have you no, know, I do stand up and I feel comfortable doing that. But if someone's like even just like being in like a Zoom meeting and they're like, can you talk about like your role here? And I like have a panic attack because I'm like I have to say something serious. <laughs> but if for tips, it's like I definitely honed that skill from stand up and writing jokes so just like finding what it is like you know what the fact is and then coming up with the punchline for it and like you said it is finding the absurdities most of the time so just like yeah honing in on that and and amplifying how absurd it is that makes sense <laughs> i'm going to read a short excerpt from today's uh newsletter It says, uh, stigma and shame literally kill. Dehumanization is the basis for violence. Once you convince people that some people aren't people, that's how you get to detention centers, prisons, war and genocide, killing women, children, 
whole communities, and the earth. So let's stop shaming people for things like being a whore and start shaming them for things like being a misogynist. (laughs) So there you go. That's perfect. Like, it breaks it down. It makes it so simple. Okay, I want to back up a little bit. How did you how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Doing like working for the old profession podcast? Yeah, I guess just like everything that you're doing. Um sure, I'll start like, start from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> so I moved to New York to pursue my dream of, of comedy writing. I want to write for TV, maybe someday still. We'll see. Life mm-hmm. I've learned that life takes you on unexpected paths. Um and I came here and I started doing stand up and um, that mostly pays in like drink tickets at like dive bars. Um, you know, it's not a very until you become like mega famous, it does not pay. Right. So I always had to have side hustle jobs. Um, and my main one in, in Brooklyn was being a full time nanny. And I got really fucking sick of taking care of other people's kids. Mm-hmm. So um, I started camming online. And I was like, oh, now this I can do. I can, like, make my own schedule. I've, you know, I, I enjoyed the the kind of, I mean, I always want to be careful to not say, like, all sex work is empowering because it doesn't have to be empowering. And to have it be empowering is a privilege. But I did. I was like, oh, I like this. Um, and then I went and auditioned at a strip club. And I was like, oh, I really like this. <laughs> Um, being able to just like physically show up and, you know, do the work, get paid, leave. Uh, I remember like, I, I've talked about this before with people, like, especially as a woman, like the first night I left with like, you know, a big wad of cash in my bag. I had never felt that feeling before of like, it was really liberating to be like, you know, I just made that myself. I don't have to stress about bills for a bit. Like, yeah. I had never felt that like financial liberation of, of making money like that. Um, so then I kept dancing for yeah, time is so weird now. So yeah. what fucking year is it? Um, I, I danced. That was, became my main source of income was stripping. And um, then I got, I had already, you know, been interested in sex worker rights and, and obviously it was like sex worker, sex workers work and sex workers are people very, obvious things to me but you know then being a part of it got you know got more real. passionate <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like hey yeah this really does affect people um so I, and I started like putting it in my stand-up a lot um I've heard a lot of lazy bad jokes that like make sex workers the the butt of the joke a lot of bad dumb hooker jokes it's always really fun when like I'm on a show and like the guy before me says something really disrespectful about strippers and then I get up there and open with I'm a stripper mm-hmm. and I see his face like oh shit <laughs> hey <laughs> we we're in the audience too yep they're they're uh, around <laughs> and there's they're also people mm. yeah because That's people awesome. there's that saying with like someone you know is a sex worker they just I don't feel comfortable telling you. So like when you're saying things like that and making those horrible lazy jokes, chances are you're saying it to a sex worker at least at some point. Mm-hmm. But and making it very clear that like she or he should not be comfortable around you cuz you look down on them. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I got into my my comedy. I became very passionate about it. I wrote some articles for Betches about like decriminalizing sex work. Um they were great about letting me do that which I felt was was really cool to be able to reach that audience Mm -hmm. um and then I got really into sex work twitter (laughs) um so it's a great it's a great place to be a lot of progressive like Mm -hmm. social strippers (laughs) is a great niche to be in um and then um I know Caitlin from comedy because Caitlin Caitlin Haley the Caitlin and Bailey, the host of the Oldest Profession podcast, is also a comedian. Hmm. So we like run into each other in in New York in those circles, and then she and I were kind of talking over Twitter on sex work Twitter, and um, then she called me up over the summer and was like, "I'm starting a company, Old Pro Productions," <laughs> and like uh, she's like, "Can I run some things by you?" And then she was like, "Hey, actually, I need a social media manager. Like, can you apply?" <laughs> and I did. And she gave me the job and yeah, it's been great. That's awesome. That is that's also like similarly like you get to make your own hours kind of? Like you have yeah. more freedom? <laughs> it's like I mean it is 
kind of a day job and but mm-hmm. Kate is great about like <laughs> she knows that I live on stripper schedule and I'm like you know we'll check in and, and have meetings but I'm like sometimes you're gonna notice that like <laughs> like oh Irene did a bunch of work at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I mean whatever yeah if, she's like as long there. as you get the work done I don't care <laughs> yeah that's great you mentioned earlier uh like having the privilege to be like empowered by sex work and I think that's like a a distinction that a lot of people just don't make at all and also like that conflation between like sex work and trafficking like do you want to talk about that at all like I think don't some people use well I don't know yeah you know more about it than I do but it just seems like people have like a lot of bad faith arguments that are like just based on nothing but yeah yeah exactly I always like to say is like, you know, a lot of these things that we believe about sex work are just because we were told them over and over again from a young age. And we just decided that to believe it as truth, you know, and which mm-hmm. is what I'm going to do is poke holes in those and be like, this is absurd. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, like people hold sex work to such an unfair standard. Like I was saying, like, you know, cause people are like, is it empowering or isn't it? And it's like, no one's asking like, yeah, just ask her. Yes. Like- if they're feeling empowered at work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like I've worked at, you know, sweet green. I definitely didn't feel empowered there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And like, you know, work is work. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's gonna be in my experience, you know, it's like, yeah, I like stripping. It's the job. I think I've, liked the most out of all my jobs but there's definitely times where I'm like this customer fucking sucks and I don't want to be here and I'm Mm -hmm. exhausted because you know working sucks yeah (laughs) and yeah obviously I am privileged that I'm like a able-bodied white cis woman who gets to benefit from that a lot in sex work and a lot of people here's the thing it's like and this relates to trafficking it's like of course no one should be doing sex work if they don't want to be doing it and that can mean that a lot of people end up in sex work because they feel that they have no other way to turn but i wouldn't say that that's like sex work's fault and like sex work isn't inherently good or inherently bad it's just Mm -hmm. a profession Mm -hmm. but the desperation to make money and if it's doing something that makes you feel bad and that is true for some people, that's capitalism's fault, you know, right. <laughs> that that comes from from capitalism and the fact that we force people to work to put food on their table. Right. So, yeah. And, and people think that everyone who does sex work is like only doing it as a last resort. And that's just not true at all. It is true for some people. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I don't want that for them. And then there are people who are literally trafficked and coerced into it. And that is horrendous and it should not happen. But that is not the same thing as consensual sex work. And people just like to think that it is and conflating them is incredibly dangerous because you can't um, not acknowledge, but you can't like attack two different things with the same solution, you know? So if mm-hmm. you're treating consensual sex work, like it's trafficking is completely damaging because they're just locking people up for doing their adult consensual work, you know, mm-hmm. and acting as if it's a crime. <clears throat> um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, the, yeah, the answer is just like, it's just like both things can be true at the same time. Like, please be able, like, I just think everybody should be able to hold two things in their head and that like consensual sex work can be a thing and sex trafficking can be a thing. And like, it's mm-hmm. just, things are more complicated yet than a lot of, also, like, like, like yes, Republicans definitely like. exists and it's horrible and it should not exist at all. But they also, people kind of, I don't want to say make it seem like it's more present than it is, but they do, like, point to things and call it sex trafficking when it's not. Which, yeah, fuels to the fire of this, like, you know, stigmatizing sex work. Because then they also do all these, like, you know, things too. Where, like, we're going to stop trafficking and all they do is arrest these quote unquote victims and put them in jail. And I'm like, who, who is this helping? Yeah. Who are you helping? <laughs> who are you helping by, by putting these people in prison and, and ruining their lives? Um, right. And making it also, harder for them in the future to get other, other jobs. Right. Exactly. And, and all, yeah, putting anyone in prison is not helping them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even just that whole narrative adds to, again, fuels the fire of that, like sex work is something to be ashamed of. So then it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy that, a lot of like if people do feel like they're 
sex work is their only option and they feel horrible about it because they're dirty and quote unquote whatever that's coming from this idea that it's bad and, and, and you know they don't necessarily need to feel bad about it mm -hmm. obviously if some people aren't comfortable with it and don't want to do it that's fine but yeah. that, that shame and stigma is is all coming from this narrative that it's this horrible criminal thing yeah they're letting like their own moral judgment cloud like it does places that it doesn't belong right people are always like oh like you know think it from their own standpoint they're like I could never do sex work it's like that's fine you don't know we're not asking you to <laughs> I could never be an accountant <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for real <laughs> luckily I, both of us don't have to <laughs> yeah and like I'm not trying to keep you from being an accountant so you don't need to try to keep me from doing what I want to be doing exactly I, I think like I'm hopeful because I think kids today, I'm 29 and I didn't learn like anything about like consent or boundaries in school. Mm -hmm. um, do you think like, cause, but now kids are, I think like they're definitely, they definitely have like parts of their classes that they're talking about like consent and boundaries, which I think is really important. But like, do you think if more people understood that they would be able to like hold in their head like, oh, like there's no, there's no victim like the same with like drug dealing, like, mm -hmm. like it's a consensual adult who's like trying to get this substance. Like it's, there's no victim in that crime. Like this is the same, like, why are you bothering to penalize it? But do you think if people understood the idea of like consent better, they would not be so shitty around this? Yeah. I think consent is such an important concept that, yeah, I'm also, I'm going to be 29 next week. So my oh, health. Ha happy almost birthday. I'm going to be 30. Thank you. Two weeks. <laughs> Oh, Pisces. Yay. Um, yeah, that was just completely glossed over in our sex ed. You know, it was more like they just taught us how to not get raped. Um, you right. know, <laughs> like, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and like showed terrifying images of what like HPV and herpes would look like. <laughs> like you know okay, what? Great. I hold those and it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, Who doesn't have HPV at this point? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's more concerning. Um, but yeah, because it's interesting because consent is like something that people who don't understand sex work are so worried that it's not involved in sex work. But I feel like doing sex work has made me more in touch with my boundaries and made me have to learn how to be, not have to learn, but it made me better at stating my boundaries and, and um, making consent very important. So, and yeah, it is, it's. A consensual act and it goes along with the idea the feminist mantra of my body my choice so if we could just take that like bodily autonomy and take that over you know take it to the next level of someone's a woman's body is her body and she can do what she wants with it mm -hmm. yeah she wants to make money off of it i know that upsets people but <laughs> yeah but like they're gonna be sexualizing you anyway like you might as well make some money off of it yeah, when I told like my boss I was a stripper, she was like, um, she was so cute. For she was like, well, I'm not going to come see you perform, though. And I was like, I fucking hope not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. You can be supportive and like not. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> but then she was like, well, I just hope you don't feel objectified. And I was like, I've felt objectified every day of my life since I hit like 13, you know? For because sure. At least I'm now getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. And also, and it's like on your terms. Yeah, and objectification is like again, it's, that's not my problem. Like, I'm like if you look at me and see an object, that sounds like something you need to unpack with your therapist. Like, right. I know it's not an object. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, can you break down Sesta Fosta for me? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, take a deep breath because I feel like it's this thing that I'm like constantly explaining, but every time I go to explain it, I'm like. <sighs> wait what <laughs> it's, I know it's a lot but okay wait how can I tell you what I perceive about it and you can tell me what's right and what's wrong yes that works. okay so it seems it seems it's like a bunch of people who are not sex workers who are like probably mostly old white rich dudes were like we got to save these people and we're gonna take down the way that they find customers online I don't know customer clients I don't know what the right word is it just okay it seems like it did a lot of damage without doing like any good at all 
<laughs> okay. Well, that unfortunately. That right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and just gave people less less safe places to find work online. Is that? Yeah, totally. So okay. it's they they kind of pitched it as like um, a way to stop online sex trafficking. Um, I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for exactly right now. Like fight online sex trafficking act. That's awesome. Mm. <laughs> um, which you know, at face value, sounds fantastic, right? Mm-hmm. We- I don't want sex trafficking happening, um, which is why it got because like Trump signed it into law in 2018, I believe, and it got like very bipartisan support. There's only a few people that voted against it. Ro Khanna is a um, congressman who is one of the only people who originally voted against it um, originally because he was like, this is against like censorship, like this is freedom of speech kind of thing, and then. <laughs> Because of his support of it, he got in contact with sex workers and he's been working with them. Um, That's cool. He's working to get a bill passed that will like force them to do a study on the effects of it, which I'm like, oh, you didn't do a study to begin with? Yeah, huh. <laughs> to prove that it has done damage and it's not good. But anyway, so what it like the inter- what it actually does is before SESA FOSA was passed, Section 230, um, basically stated that if someone was doing partaking in like illegal sex crimes like sex trafficking or sex work online the the website host or the company or the app couldn't get in trouble just the third parties of the people orchestrating whatever criminal activity but the sestafasa amends 230 to say that the website themselves will also be held accountable so you know if you're on craig's it you own Craigslist and someone is conducting sex trafficking, which is not really happening. It's mostly just conventional sex work happening on there. Then the owner of Craigslist will also get slapped with a sex trafficking charge. So that makes websites not want sex workers (laughs) on their, on their website. They do not want that fine and that charge. Um, what this did is um, a lot of sex workers use, we used to use Backpage and yeah, a lot of online screening stuff so that you can screen your clients before you see them, which makes it much safer, right? You can mm-hmm. do background checks to make sure you're not dealing with serial killer. Which uh, you have to do yourself because there are no workplace protections for right. sex workers. Right, you're your HR, your manager, your, right. your everything. Um, and, you know, there are also like a lot of online communities of sex workers to we have like to like be like oh look out for this person you know just like a lot of communication that made things a lot safer um mm-hmm. so sesta fossa got rid of that safety net and makes it so you know it pushes everything more underground pushes people into more street-based work which is you don't get the chance to, to screen your clients so it's obviously more dangerous mm-hmm. and sex workers predicted that this was going to happen they asked you know did all the calling please don't pass this bill this is it's going to make it go underground it's going to make it more unsafe and no one listens to sex workers because they think that we're like, you know, oh, you don't know. You don't mm-hmm. know what's best for you. I know what's best for you, baby. And right. it's like, no, we actually do know. We're the ones doing it, like living the experiences. And it turns out that they were right. So they should have listened to them. Um, it's very refreshing. Kamala Harris was the co-sponsor of it. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So listeners call it call your call your reps and tell them to to repeal it and then when keep, i'm gonna keep an eye out for when rokana is trying to pass his bill because that would be very helpful that would be very cool he was the core and it was the sponsor in that bill as well oh good yeah we i always try to point out like pay attention to who in congress is fighting for the things that like you care about i mean i guess that's true all the time but like I don't know. Republicans are worried about like Dr. Seuss and like, (laughs) meanwhile, like the climate is burning and like, like, I don't know, there's just so much like real stuff to focus on. So yeah, just pay attention to like who's focusing on the real stuff that's going to make actual people's lives better versus who is like not passing climate change legislation because like Charles Koch is his biggest donor or something. Right, exactly. The thing with Sesta Fossa too is like, I think, I believe that it was very intentionally made to be like, this is going to stop sex trafficking. When in reality, they knew they just wanted to like have easier access to busting conventional sex work, which is what they're using it for. 
And the thing with that, because some people might be like, well, I'm not a sex worker, so, you know, what do I care? But the thing is, is that, like, they're not going to stop with sex right. work. You know, it's like, again, it starts with sex, even with what's happening online now, like, since the whole Pornhub thing happened. Um, what's that? I don't know what that is. Pornhub got in trouble, as they showed, that they were, like, not great. They didn't have a great system for, um, like finding when stuff is posted like without consent ah okay so then there was like this whole article written about it and then it like kind of fueled the anti-porn swerf movement of being like porn is horrible and non-consensual and it's like well no not always and sometimes and then um like mastercard and and, like won't pulled out of Pornhub like they won't oh right 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 over all the porn performers yeah um which again, people think they're you know trying to save sex workers, but then they're just like taking away their income. And then I noticed since then that like censorship online got like even more intense because I think other websites were afraid of you know having what happened to Pornhub happen to them. I got banned from Twitter. I get I get banned in, in violations all that. I'm banned from Hinge <laughs> <laughs> and Tinder. But you have uh, a boyfriend. It's fine, right? You have, it seems like you have a very nice, supportive boyfriend. <laughs> yeah we're open so we do see other people but i mean i hate online dating anyway so yeah. whatever it's just the principle of the matter <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're trying to erase sex workers online basically and then that will lead to trying to erase and censor women and, and queer people and non-binary people and they're not going to stop you know you start yeah. with the more vulnerable communities when no one will stick up for them and then you work your way up to you know until it's handmade still <laughs> yes yep uh, yeah and <laughs> That's a, I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't know why, but I did. Ha, I did, was having like Handmaid's Tale like visions for some for some reason. That's, I, that's kind I of know. Uh, um. Okay, how do you think we can package decriminalization of sex work for like upper middle class suburban women? a great question because i feel like my main argument is because i'm so like fuck the police but i'm like i'm always like well we just need to get the police out of our business because they're pigs but then i'm like mm-hmm. wait we'll like the police <laughs> yes it's uh, yeah i have sometimes mm, it doesn't matter sorry go on <laughs> i heard caitlin um once said it very succinctly of just like two consenting adults should be able to have sex without the law being involved whether or not money is exchanged mm-hmm. like it's just that just seems so obvious to me yeah um but yeah for, for like suburban um it's um yeah reiterating that it's like these are consenting adults i think using the like feminism like my body my choice resonates with them the, the white feminist <laughs> women of the suburbs mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah and, and being like why are we criminalizing people and even if you want to do like you know putting people in 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 prison is coming out of your tax dollars so (laughs) yeah actually i've never i don't know i've never really thought about it that way but that makes sense Mm -hmm. um all right is there anything else that you wish people knew before i ask you if you have any good stories about like shitty conservative (laughs) (laughs) ex-boyfriends um yeah, I guess just that, like, sex workers are, really like, very smart, well-equipped, you know, people who, who aren't, like, you know, sad victims that are don't know what's best for them, that, that they are, listen to sex workers. You're fully able to advocate for yourself. hmm Yeah. Just, and in all systems, just, like, listen to the people who are affected. Like, they know what they need. Exactly. People know what's best for them. Yeah. All right. So Morgan and I talk a lot about our shitty ex-boyfriends. I feel like a lot of these episodes are inspired by like arguments that we've had with them. And then like I later won in the shower, but like never actually got to win. <laughs> but, um, and like it's embarrassing. I almost exclusively dated Republicans, which like, oops, but like when you know better, you do better, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you have any stories about like dating somebody more conservative and then being like, oh, this is never going to work? 
You know, I didn't, I, I had like one boyfriend in high school and I don't even know if we can count that as like a legit relationship. I think we can. <laughs> He's probably a Republican now. I'm not sure. He, he was like obsessed with his truck. So mm-hmm. I can only imagine. I'm from Maine. So, huh. <laughs> and then I had, I didn't date again until my senior year of college. Um, he wasn't a Republican and my current partner is very progressive. But I guess we could say, like, because I'm so, like, leftist <laughs> that even, like, some people who are, like, Democrats are, like, too conservative for me. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, I've definitely had sex with a lot of Republicans. I went to I went to college in, in Boston, so it puts a yeah. chill on my spine to think of, like, probably how many, like, libertarian and <laughs> yes. Republican men I've let inside me. Yep. <laughs> I lived but, in central Illinois for the last 10 years before this, and I was in a relation two relationships for a really really long time and then when I got out of one I was like I'm gonna have a one night stand like I've never done that before like that seems fun and then as soon as it was over he like it somehow politics came up and he mentioned that he's a Trump voter and I was like I gotta go and then I've never done that again and like now I'm engaged so I don't think it's gonna happen but like that that one was like enough to ruin it for me for life because like that was not fun to find out at all yeah, I live in Brooklyn, so I feel like I'm usually pretty pretty safe. That when I, if I like meet someone random, they're probably not a Republican, but mm-hmm. you know they exist around here. Um, they're everywhere. Yeah, unfortunately, I deal with a lot of Republicans at the strip club. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> do you have any like? <laughs> I'm sure you do, but like people there who are like you're just like, oh my god, please, I don't stop. Yeah, I had one time some guy, I try to have a rule of no talking politics because then I don't make any money. <laughs> oh, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, I've had a, a few too many glasses of champagne and then I let my, my views be known. And I remember I was arguing with some guy about, and then I think something about capital. I, got, I went way too far. Like, <laughs> I, said, I don't believe in capitalism. <laughs> like, well, you're a capitalist. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you have a job. And I was like, well, yeah, I have to participate in society to survive. Right. And we live it's in the only capital. system that exists, so. So what do you oh. want me to do? <laughs> I was like, also, like, capitalism is, like, exploiting labor, but I'm exploiting my own labor. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I did date this one guy in, like, right in between, right in between boyfriends. What's that called? A rebound. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he was, it was literally, like, right after I broke up with my boyfriend. And, you know, when you, like, get kind of dive into the, you know, all of a sudden I was like at his house every night, you know, mm-hmm. and like two weeks go by and you're like, wait, who is this person? And he kind of sucks. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> How did I get here? Right. Why do I have right. a toothbrush at his place? <laughs> yeah. And, um, he was, we were talking and I like mentioned how my friend had been raped or, and he was like, like raped or like rape, raped and like did like a punching thing. And I was like, Oh, I cannot let you inside. Oh, Yeah. That was the last time I saw him. <laughs> Good job. I'm I'm proud of you. Way to have standards. Yeah. But yeah. That's a good good like lesson for anybody listening. If somebody tries to differentiate between like rape and rape rape, like ghost you gotta go. They got yeah, you're ghost ghost away. Mm-hmm. You have our permission. Um well that's very funny. Thanks for sharing that. Um is there is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap up or how can we support you like where do you want to definitely follow the old pro newsletter that i'm requiring that but how else can we support you (laughs) um i also have my own pages um on instagram i'm underscore irene marrow i think sorry so i was banned from twitter like i said (laughs) and then i created a new twitter and now they just gave me my old twitter back so i'm like which which handle do i use so Mm -hmm. oh at irene f marrow Marrow is M E R R O W. Um, if, if, I don't know what your listeners are into, but on OnlyFans, I'm onlyfans.com slash Lucy Star with two R's. I also have a podcast it's called Good Porn in America. Me and my oh, I didn't know that. all talk about porn. It's a lot of fun. And I'll yeah. have to check that out. And if that is something that you guys are into, um, Irene gets incredible ratings on OnlyFans and she's in like the top, I don't know, 4% of creators or something like that. But I have seen like so many compliments, like you're doing a great job. So just, Thank you. yes. Yeah, screenshot them and put them on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be, yes, I would be so proud. 
just <laughs> I would I would like tattoo it to my forehead. It's like yes. Yeah, that's a bad one. <laughs> well, I had so much fun talking to you t- today, Irene. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Me too. This was so great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I loved talking to Irene. I hope you guys enjoyed listening. Um, if you want to be part of the solution, uh, the answer is normalizing sex work and supporting women, supporting sex workers, supporting decriminalization. Um, you can let your legislators know that you support decriminalization of all consensual adult sex work because sex workers' rights are human rights and sex workers know what's best for them. Um, if you're interested in taking some actions this week, um, the ACLU is always a good place to donate. Uh, they are also calling for full decriminalization of sex work. Um, there is a virtual workshop hosted on Zoom that is co-sponsored by Asian Americans Advancing Justice and Holla Back, where um, they teach you how to intervene effectively as a bystander without ever having to compromise your safety. So if you were to encounter like racism or sexism or xenophobia or what, you know, whatever, um, they teach you, I think it's like the five D's and one of them is like distract, which is just like, if you're in a grocery store, just like knock something over if there's a confrontation and that could diffuse it. Um, so I took, <laughs> I took this class last year, undoubtedly inspired by some other horrible hate crime. Um, And it was really good. It's only like an hour. Um, So you can sign up for that in the bio or in our link tree. And then, you know, we're repealing bad laws that only harm people, that only affect the people that they harm, like SESTA-FOSTA and others. um, I don't know. We didn't talk about too many other like bullshit laws, but um, in some places, carrying condoms can be evidence of prostitution. So being a public health person, I know that that's not going to stop anybody from having sex. It's just going to stop people from having safe sex because sex workers don't carry around condoms because if they were to be stopped by the police, they could use that as evidence of prostitution. And that's some bullshit. So there's other like very stupid laws out there like that. Um, but just keep in mind that sex workers are more than capable advocating for themselves. And most of them support full decriminalization of consensual adult sex work. Um, And more and more politicians are understanding why that's important every day. All right, I guess that's it for serious stuff this week. Um, If you're listening to to this the day it comes out, it's my mom's 60th birthday. (laughs) Our chaos foster kitten should be getting adopted today. I will be so sad. He pooped in my room again yesterday. I will be so sad if they call me at three to go get him and we have to keep him for another week. Um, But we have another foster mom in the basement. She's having two or three kittens in a couple weeks and she is the sweetest. One of you should adopt her. All right, I guess that's it. Um, Happy belated birthday to Irene. Um, Keep in mind that sex work isn't inherently bad or inherently good. It is just work. Um, Sex workers aren't sad victims. They're very smart. They know what's best for them. Yeah, and follow Irene on everything. She's she's hilarious and, um, you know, has, has a lot of really great takes. All right, I'll talk to you guys next week. We are talking about Roe versus Wade and what would happen in various states based on whether you have protections for abortion or expanded access for abortion. We also talk about a specific law in Illinois and probably lots of other places called um, parental notice of abortion. So we are trying to repeal parental notice of abortion because just like sex workers, uh, young people are fully capable of deciding what they need and we should trust them. Uh, So Thank you, everybody, for spending this time with me this week, and I will talk to you guys next week. Thank you guys so much for listening to For Your Misinformation. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast, and if you like it, give us a rating and a review. It helps us find more listeners, and the more of us there are, the better. And make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter at FYMIPod. Shout out to Ben Schlofeld for the audio production, Hope Die for the podcast art, 
Kyle Dibdahl for the intro and outro music, and Adam Roston, who edits these videos every week so you can watch them on YouTube. We come out with new episodes every Monday.